Hello, welcome back. We're going to apply the example to, the, to compute the financial ratios that we have. So first we have the current ratio. Current ratio is defined as current asset divided by current liability. So very important is to know where are these items located. So this is from um, uh, your financial accounting course, which tells us, which you, we have learned that current asset and current liability are both balance sheet accounts. So we expect to be able to find that in current asset. Uh, in the balance sheet. So current asset is $871,155. Divide that by current liability. Current liability is $435,000. So in here I'm using 2016 as the year that we are computing. So when we divide current asset of $871,550 by current liability of $435,000 that give us a current ratio of a little bit over two. So it's 2.0036 times. So that means that our current asset is two times, or a little bit more than two times our current liability. That's good news because that means that if we are able to convert our current asset into cash within one year, which is the definition of current asset, we'll be able to pay off our liability within one year. Again, that's the definition of current liability. Um, in addition to that, we may want to com compute a slightly more conservative ratio, and that's called a quick ratio. The quick ratio is recognized that inventory may take a while to liquidate. So in times of distress, particularly, for example, if your company get into, remember this is short-term solvency, short-term problems. Let's say a company has a product recall and won't be able to sell its inventory how would that affect the viability of the firm? So we want to compute a quick ratio, which is defines current asset minus inventory divided by current liability. So inventory here is $485,000. So to compute the quick ratio, we'll take $871,550 and subtract $485,000 from it. So you can see that to compute the quick ratio, we subtract inventory from total current asset, divide that by current liability, and that gives us a quick ratio of 0 0.886. So this is less than one. That means if we do get into a situation where we cannot sell any of our inventory and convert that into cash, we will not have enough money to cover our current liability. Uh, that's not unusual because you most companies operate as a going concern, which means that it's not common for a company to carry enough cash to pay off all its liability for the for the coming year without having to sell any inventory. So this number is less than one, which pretend, which um, represent a little bit of risk. But again, that is not an extreme amount of risk because that is the um, you you expect and operate under the assumptions that a company can sell some of its inventory. Um, but it does give you a, an idea on what is one of the potential worst case scenario. Obviously, cash ratio is even more extreme. It takes into account only cash and not any other um, very, um asset that you have on hand in order to compute um, is cash ratio. So if you're computing the cash ratio, cash for this company is $70,000 divided by current liability of $435,000. So that's how you would compute the current ratio, quick ratio, and um, cash ratio. These calculations are included in your in the PowerPoint slide. So you, after you do the calculation, be sure to go back to the slide to check that you have got the right answer. Next, we're going to compute the total debt ratio. Now, there are multiple ways you can compute the total debt ratio, in uh, at least for the numerator. Um, in the formula that's provided here, the book suggests that you take total asset minus total equity. If you remember your accounting identity, total asset and total debt together becomes total 
as uh, total equity and total debt becomes total asset. So because total asset must equal to debt plus equity, you can infer what total debt is by subtracting equity from total asset. But another way to compute total debt is to add up all the liabilities. So remember that we are looking for total debt. So that's the numerator that we are, we are computing. There's two ways you can do that. One is to add up the firm's liability. So it has current liability of $435,000, has long-term liability of $205,000. So if you add these two together, that will give you a total debt. So if you add up the total liability, you will end up with a total debt of $640,000. Now let's take a look at the other approach, which is to subtract total asset from total equity. So total asset is $3,096,550, and total equity is $245,655. And of course, it should not surprise us that we end up with the same number because this is the fundamental accounting identity, that total asset equals total debt plus total equity. So our total debt is $640,000, and we can divide that by total asset. So that would be $640,000 divided by total asset of $3,096,550. And that gives us a total debt ratio of 0.2067%, so um, or 20.67%. What that tells us is that the firm financed about 21, 20, or 20.67% using debt. And, um, and that's very important information because you can then compare how highly leveraged a firm is against its competitor. Um, Another ratio that's very closely related to the total debt ratio is the total is the debt to equity ratio. So the debt to equity ratio is defined as total debt divided by total equity. So here we know that total debt is $640,000 and total equity, let me raise some of these so we can see, total equity is 2.4 dollars So and this is a this, this is an important distinction that I want to um point out. Sometimes we can notice that there is um total equity and there is total common stock equity. And the reason why there is a difference in this particular example is because this firm uses prefer stock. So when we define the accounting definition of total equity includes both prefer stock and common stock. Uh, common stock, a uh, prefer stock is not very common for a majority of company. And for companies that don't have preferred stock at all, there's no confusion. However, prefer stock is becoming more and more popular because of venture capital firms. So a lot of a lot of times venture capital firms when they come when they take a company public, they retain preferred stocks. So if a company that has preferred stock, we need to take into account. So if you have a company that have preferred stock and you're computing ratios that has to do with equity, sometimes the ratio is computed based on just common stock equity. So for example, return earnings or return on equity, what you need to pay attention to is if you're using net income available to common stockholders, then you need to divide that by common stock equity. Um, the same is true for common stock multiplier. So anytime what we try to do is to match common stock items to common stock items. So it is a good idea to include the term common stock in front of equity 
when you are working with a company that has um, preferred stocks. So instead of just writing equity multiplier, you will write common stock equity multiplier. And instead of just net income, you want to distinguish between net income available to both preferred stock and common stock holders, or you are talking about net income available only to common stock holders. So just make sure that you're matching common stock to common stock and total equity to total equity. So in this example, if we are, when we are computing the debt to equity ratio, um, since this company does use preferred stock, we need to be specific. We, we, need to, we need to specify whether or not we are computing the debt to common equity ratio or debt to total equity ratio. So if we are computing debt to common stock equity ratio, then we will replace the denominator here that says total equity with common equity. So again, we just need to be, pay attention to matching um, what we are computing. If we are computing common equity, we need to be sure that we write down common equity and use common equity. Um, in our example, if we are using common equity, so here's our common total common equity is $2.256 million. So if you divide total debt by $2,256,550, that will give us a debt to equity or debt to common equity ratio of 28.36%. Uh, And you can do the same for equity multiplier. There are different ways to compute equity multiplier. One is you take total asset divided by, again, if you're working with common equity, that will be total asset divided by total common equity. And if you are computing the total equity multiplier, then you'll be total asset divided by total um, equity. Reason why I want to emphasize common equity versus total equity is because it's very unusual for a company to sell additional preferred stock. Uh, most of the time, if a company needs to raise money, it will issue additional debt or may, you may issue additional common stock. Issuing additional preferred stock is very unusual. So um, therefore, for purpose of analyzing the financial ratio, a lot of times we use common ratio instead of total common equity ratio instead of total equity ratio. So for computing equity multiplier, so there are two ways we can compute this number. One is we take total asset, which will be three million ninety-six thousand five hundred and fifty dollars divided by total equity and a total common equity and that will be you get 1.3722 as your equity multiplier and what that tells us is that for every dollar that the firm of uh, for every dollar that the firm issue in equity because it's called multiplier the firm will be able to borrow an additional 37 cents and be able to purchase a dollar 37 cents worth of asset. So that's why it's called a multiplier. It's a multiplier because we assume that a company is going to borrow at the same current debt ratio. And just like you're buying um, a car on, on, on loan or you're buying a house on loan, you don't have to come up with the entire price of the car. You just have to come up with enough equity and then you can borrow the, the rest. The same is true for company. If a company wants to build a new factory or open a new restaurant, they don't have to come up with the entire equity amount. They just need to come up some. In this case, if they come up with a dollar, they can borrow another 37 cents and be able to buy something, buy a restaurant or buy equipment um, that is worth $1.37. So the multiplier is an important um, tool for us to see how much money the company has to raise in order to finance new projects. As we noted earlier, most of the, most companies do not have preferred stocks. So we're going to compute um, the same ratios using total equity. So if, and this will be 
true this will be all the analysis will be correct for companies that don't use preferred stock at all um, I include a company that have both preferred stock and common stock for a comprehensive example but for majority of the company that you see very seldom would you see preferred stock so if you're using total equity we can compute the same total uh, debt to equity ratio so if you're using total equity we're using the 2.4 million of $2,456,555 as our denominator. And when you compute that, you turn out that, again, total debt doesn't change, you remain at $640,000. Um, we'll end up with a debt to equity ratio of 0 0.2605. Did you get the same answer? Right now we can compute the equity multiplier. So again, total asset doesn't change. Um, now we divide total asset by total equity, and total equity turns out. And that answer again, go ahead and do the calculation. It turns out to be one point two six zero five. Notice that these two numbers differ only by one, and that is not a coincidence. In in fact, this is always always true particularly if a company does not use preferred stock. If a company does not use preferred stock, the equity multiplier is always equal to one plus the debt to equity ratio. So this is always, always true if the company does not use preferred stock. So I want to keep that in mind. As, as long as you are working with a company that does not use common stock, this relationship will always hold. And what that means is that um, you get, so, so the debt to equity ratio tells us that for every dollar that a company brings in as equity, you will borrow 26 cents. And of course, that will make sense that for every dollar that the company brings in as equity, you'll be able to purchase a dollar 26 worth of equipment because it will borrow 26 cents on the dollar that you brought in as equity. The next two solvency ratio has to do with times interest earned and cash coverage ratio. And both of these items, earnings before interest and tax and interest, comes from the income statement. So EBIT stands for earnings before interest and tax. So it's EBIT. So earnings before interest and tax is $240,000. And interest expense as you see in here is twenty thousand dollars. So we can comp we can compute the times interest earns ratio. And in our example, that ratio turns out to be twelve times. And you may ask, is that good or bad? That seems to, so. In other words, we earn twelve times more than what is needed to cover interest. Um, that's relatively high, and again, that depends on the industry average and what the bankers are uh, typically um, required. In the case that the times interest earnings ratio is not quite as high as 12, perhaps, um, then you may want to also c compute something called the cash coverage ratio. Because even though earnings before interest and tax is the operating income of the firm, some of the expenses are considered non-cash expense. The largest of such expense is depreciation. The argument here is that depreciation is, is not cash that the company has to pay somebody else, but rather is, a, uh, is an accounting item. And therefore, in case of an emergency, that cash can be used to pay for interest. So we can compute a cash coverage ratio, which is EBID, EB, earnings before interest and tax plus depreciation. So we'll add these two together first. So that will be $240,000 um, divided by the interest of $20,000. And when you compute that, again, uh, I suggest that you pause the video and go through the calculation. 
uh, you should get 13 and a half uh, times. So it's 13.5 times cash, cash coverage ratio. So for this company, um, we, also, we need to comp compare the number against an industry average, but on a cash flow basis, based only on times interest earned ratio and cash coverage ratio, is long-term financial uh, solvency is in relatively good shape. It's earning 12 times the interest, is has a cash coverage ratio of 13.5, and its liability is about 20%, um, less than 21% of its total asset. We will stop in this video. In the next video, we will continue with the remaining set of ratios.